Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the last talk, uh, Tech Import, last sessions. Uh, for first edition, this was amazing. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, so in the silver room, uh, Luis Almeida from Jumia will be talking about uh, how we got everything into containers and we shipped it out to Africa. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about our migration from a traditional infrastructure where we had machines being provisioned by configuration management, traditional configuration management, to a container-based infrastructure. So, sorry. So a little bit about our team and at here at Porto. So we have 56 team members currently. Uh, they're basically the type of work that each one of them does is described here. Uh, most of us work for the company for a long time. The, the oldest ones work with the company from the beginning, which is five years. We mainly work with agile methodologies. Um, of the 56 workers team members that we have, we have most uh, about 80% are technical guys. So they work here at the top tier. Uh, the rest are product owners, business owners, and so on. So uh, an outline of what the presentation will consist of is uh, we'll talk about uh, our legacy code. Uh, and our legacy application, the challenge that we faced to move from a base, uh, normal infrastructure to a container-based infrastructure, uh, the solutions that we applied to the challenge that we encountered, the issues that we had, and we'll look a little bit about the past and the future. So a small introduction to the company. Um, basically, Jumia was founded on the belief that internet can improve people's lives in Africa. So. It might seem quirky to say that, but it's actually true, and most of us believe in it, because to give you a practical example, in 2016, due to a huge economic crisis in Nigeria, which is going on, um, there was basically a shortage of diapers. Uh, it might seem a little bit weird for us to think about it, but in Africa, uh, trying to buy diapers for your kids is not as simple as going to the supermarket. And we saw that happening in 2016, where until to this day, we still have people purchasing huge amounts of diapers on our sites due to that shortage. So people have uh, several constraints in Africa, infrastructure constraints, uh, uh, roadways, uh, limited choice in terms of purchases, in terms of products, uh, limited information about those products. Um, the products are expensive and hard to come by. And so we try to build a platform that will help people make those choices and make their life easier. Uh, on that front. The other front is also we present people a platform when they can sell products, make a way of living and find a way to make uh, increase income, their, the, the income of their livelihood. So we try to expand people's horizons and not just the people in Africa, our own horizons. So here in Porto, we, our team strives to build a better platform, better technologies and apply them to assist us and assist the people uh, that we serve. So. Like I said, it might seem quirky, but uh, I truly believe that this is true. So in terms of legacy, um, the legacy that we had in infrastructure was we had only dedicated hosts. Uh, this means that we had to provision metal machines. So we purchased those machines from a provision from our data center. Uh, we had to rack them, we had to install them, and we had to maintain them up to date in terms of software, in terms of kernel stack, and so on. So those hosts, uh, most of those hosts, or all of those hosts, were running only one application. What does that mean? Uh, through our own stack, we have several applications, backends, frontends, APIs, and so on. And each of those hosts will only serve one function. So either the servers uh, were underutilized or overutilized, depending on the time of day and the uh, function that they had. This made it very hard to scale. First, because the way the what I told you is, we had to provision the servers, buy them, acquire them, go through the whole process. Uh, of doing that, and then we had to run the configuration management on top of the server after it was installed, and provision the server to run a specific op uh, application. So, and configuration management, the traditional configuration management that we used at the time, we went from Puppet to Salt, uh, we considered Ansible, uh, none of them were basically a good fit for what we wanted to do. Um, we try them, we use them, we still use them, but they basically do not work well on, the, on, the, on, our, on our use case specific use case, basically. So, and then we had another problem, uh, which was the build and deploy process had to be done in conjunction. They were built that way. It was something that is a legacy of what we receive in terms of, uh, of Jumia. And so we had to work around, we, had, we wanted to work around that problem because 
there are times we want to build a code and build it just to, for the purpose of building it, testing something, uh, not necessarily deploy it uh, because that takes a lot, takes a lot of time and, and, uh, and can have other issues. So this was in about a year and a half ago, the infrastructure that we had in terms of the application distribution. We had our front ends, each one had, was basically doing stuff like this, back ends. Uh, we had NFS to store uh, static content. We had RabbitMQ as a queuing system, Memcache, and then here we can see salt stack to manage all of this. And MariaDB has our persistent storage to store our database and our products and users and so on. So the only external dependency that we had about that time was uh, Algolia, which is our search provider. Um, and uh, we still maintain that for this moment. The challenges that we, uh, that we wanted to face uh, or that we faced were shifting to a DevOps culture. The first challenge to shift into a DevOps culture is understanding a DevOps culture. Uh, I can say for sure that me, I still don't fully grasp what is a DevOps culture. I'm facing that issue and I'm struggling to uh, still go to, to that. It's a mindset and most people still, still think this is a job description. For me, it's not, it's a mindset. Uh, and that's what it's hard for people to understand or I think it is, but we're not here to discuss that. So. Uh, shifting to a DevOps culture from a, a normal traditional uh, agile uh, where we have a structured company to a DevOps uh, culture. Scale out, meaning that I wanted to break out of my physical data center to another data center, having multiple data centers. Uh, I wanted to transform the application that we had from a monolith to something that could work inside containers. We, at the time, already did some centralized logging. Uh, the problem is we couldn't keep up with the logs that so uh, whenever the, the developers decided to do a new feature or a new function that they most of the times they were probably shifting a new log because it was easier for them to read just what was happening with that new function or that something. And so it's another log that we wanted to centralize and the way that we were doing at the time implied that we wanted to go to the configuration management, run the configuration management, get our servers, and then centralize that log. So it's something that was hard to keep up with. Uh, we wanted to decouple machines from the services. So that meant that we want to be able to run any, any application in one, any of our servers. Uh, so the servers cannot be bound to a specific application because we, want, we didn't want to re waste any resources that we were doing at the time. Um, this line here is still uh, very uh, somewhat uh, polemic. No? So we wanted to allow the developers to run ops command. What does that mean? So um, since we have like a team of eight people in operations and we have a team of uh, 50, uh, not 50, but close to 50 developers. How do you, do you keep uh, the developers happy, allowing them to do their day-to-day -day work without uh, having the operations overloaded with those kind of tasks that developers need? So we wanted to expose something to the developers that will allow them to do their work without impacting the operations team. And lastly, uh, on this slide at least, we wanted to containerize our persistence layer. So we wanted to um, shift our MySQL, our, our persistent layer that we saw here. So these uh, specific operations into, a, shift these into a container to allow us to easily migrate them across uh, to another server or uh, even launch them uh, faster uh, and more agile. More challenges, so we have a lot of challenges. Uh, we wanted to keep up with new technology. So uh, every day we see something like SolidDB, like we saw today in presentations, we saw other technologies emerging from the market that we wanted to test out. Uh, that might be a good fit for us to replace a piece of our technology, current stack technology, to allow us to have a faster time to market or to allow us to improve the page speed of our site. And so we wanted to ha be able to adopt those technology faster if we found there were an advantage for us. Faster software upgrades, what does this mean? So most of us run operations know that if you want to upgrade to PHP new version or to Redis new version or something, you probably go to a lengthy process uh, that will break your applications at one point or another because software might be bound to that specific version. There might be a new feature or a feature being deprecated that will impact. And we wanted to be able to have multiple versions of the same software running in conjunction so we could do that test and be able to bring basically faster upgrades. 
continuous integration. We wanted to have a better continuous integration with unit testings, uh, and at the same time, we wanted to centralize metrics. Uh, the centralization of the metrics was important uh, because we already collected a lot of metrics, uh, but they were dispersed. So we had applications metrics in one side, New Relic and so on. We had uh, server metrics on another, like uh, CPU, uh, memory, this network was being stored locally. And then we had an issue also with the service discovery. Most of the servers only talk with each other because we hard coded the paths that we used to talk with each other. So that meant whenever a service shifted to another server, uh, we were going by to the configuration manager, uh, running configuration management, and so on. So it's a lengthy process, error prone, and so on. And fastly, we wanted to make a configuration management tool that would work for us. So what was the solution? The solution was containers. Why? Uh, not because it's hype, because uh, we can easily do a container and that container will have all the configurations that we need to run an application. We basically use a situation of baking cake. For those that don't know what it means, it's basically we, when we build a container, we store that container in a private registry, and that container will persist until we delete it. So at, at any point in time, we want to revert to a specific version of our application of the, or of the configurations that we used. At any point in time, we can do that, that while the container is uh, stored. So it took all the guessing from the configuration management. It made it much easier so we have multiple versions of our configurations and we could easily and fastly switch between them. That was the first pro that we saw on Docker. The second was uh, we could easily upgrade parts of our stack at any point in time and, um, and store an image with that version and test it out or destroy it if we don't find it useful and or revert back to it forward and so on. So the reason for the containers was basically that. The main reason for the containers, obviously, there are other advantages. So this is basically the structure that we decide for our container that does it all. So our stack is not that hard. So we have at the moment supervisor, which is the one that launches all of these processes. Then we use Nginx, PHP, FPM. We use Memcache for local storage and DNS mask for uh, caching the DNS requests. And then we have a big piece of the container, which is our Jumia, our code. The container itself, it has two exposed ports, an HTTP port for Nginx and a TCP port for Surf. And this is the only port that is forwarded. So this is the only port that will always be accessible. This port is here just for us to run uh, commands in the infrastructure. So at any point in time, I might want to decide to clear the upcache from PHP FPM. I send a command to Surf and surf will first use gossip protocol to expand that command to where we surf the in the infrastructure and then execute that command on my container. So I don't need to restart my container or destroy my container to run something as simple as that. So the second part that we wanted was to break out of our physical data center. Uh, so after we had containers working in our registry, we opt out to use an orchestrator, a simple orchestrator, which is called Rancher. Uh, and that orchestrator, we basically duplicated our infrastructure in AWS using multi-AZ uh, setup. So with the container, it was fairly simple to do this. Uh, we just opted out to, instead of having DM communicated over the simple internet, we used something called Direct Connect from AWS, which basically established a dedicated connection between the two data centers, AWS and our physical data center. And with the containers, it was very simple to do. So another reason why we went to containers and not something else. Another solution, uh, another solution for a problem that we had was centralization of the logs. So the problem that I described to you guys was how would we centralize, how we'd know the logs that were being produced inside the containers as they were being produced in our servers was we don't, so we don't care. What the development team did was they write the logs to the the standard out and standard error from the container. So they write their logs out. And the container Docker, what Docker does is when you write standard out and standard error, Docker logs everything that you write there. And after you log that information, we use Docker uh, capabilities of logging to Fluent E, and automatically Fluent E is shipping those logs to a Kafka queue. From the Kafka queue, we go to the log stash, and log stash stores them in Elasticsearch. So you might ask yourselves, why do we have three lines here? So we decided as a good strategy was we won't 
uh, treat all the logs the same. We, ha we have priorities for our logins. So we have red, yellow, and green. That means red is high priority, yellow, medium priority, green, I don't care that much about those logs. So with the red, uh, they're always being processed. Uh, green and yellow, in case we have a surge of logs that our Elasticsearch cannot handle or Logstash cannot handle, I can stop them, I can wait for them to parse, but red, they need to be processed in near real time. So Kafka was a good partner for this because Kafka is easier to scale, very easy to scale. It persists the log, uh, it can persist that information across that infrastructure, and so Logstash can die, and when Logstash comes back, it connects to the Kafka queue, and from the Kafka queue, it will produce the logs to Elasticsearch. And then we present the logs to the end user using Kibana. So we centralize all our logs for our, user, for our developers to be able to consult the logs in real time, which was another issue because before that, some of the logs, they had to log into every web server, uh, tell the log, wait for the something to show up because we have several servers, so they have to wait for the request to hit that server or being telling all the servers at the same time. Uh, with this, we eliminated the guessing game and they always know where the logs are. With this uh, implementation, we start seeing like we have peaks at 9,200 events per minute. Uh, this means that we are having uh, stuff like this happening on the infrastructure. So we're starting to see peaks where surges of traffic are generating way more information that we were seeing before. So we're currently storing 160 gigabytes of logs per day. This is not that big for the infrastructure that we provision, but it's something already. Uh, we already are looking into increasing the number of Elasticsearch servers just to increase the capacity at which we can ingest the information that is being produced to Logstash. Uh, we currently have a policy of about 45 days of log storage. Now, the part that I told you was somewhat uh, tricky. So allowing devs to run ops commands. So the way what the, we chose a tool for this, run deck, run deck, um, for those that don't know, is a tool that will allow you to uh, provision, uh, define ACLs uh, for, specific, for the users uh, and then have a job associated to that user or several groups of users and that's the way we do it. So a dev can go, as long as he has a login and an ACL that will allow it, he can go there and clear the upcache for every server or clear the upcache for the CDN, or sorry, the cache for the CDN and so on. So currently these are most of the, the most important tasks that we have at the moment. We are looking to more to implement. Um, the fact that we uh, opt out to use Rondek, uh, we're still reevaluating because Rondek is not that easy to scale. It doesn't have a good HA um, capability, so it's, it's somewhat tricky. But the fact that it's in a container uh, allows us to quickly shift to another machine if the machine is running low on resources. So uh, we also took advantage of all the, the container infrastructure to allow us to have, a, for now, uh, a trick uh, Rondek to, to run all those commands. We also use Rundeck, uh, since we're here, to move the crons away from the machine. So all the crons that we're running on a specific host are now running inside Rundeck. Rundeck is like a scheduler. Uh, so we re remove that single point of failure that was happening on that machine. We shift it to a container. That container is rescheduled in case of any problem. So right now, the issues that we have with having a cron stuck on a machine for two days because of weekends uh, no longer happens. So NFS, NFS is always an issue for the people who manage it and use it. Uh, first, uh, if you don't have an appliance uh, with enough capabilities, you'll have network issues, you'll have write pr problems. Normally, read is mostly fine. So we decided to move away from NFS to an object storage. Uh, object storage that we chose was React.js. React works on top of React KV. Uh, and implements an S3 compatible API. So we use REST API now to talk with our object storage. And that way, if we need to decide that our implementation of our S3 is not enough, we can move to Google Compute or use AWS S3 implementation and increase our capacity exponentially. So object storage also has the advantage of you have fine grained ACLs and scalability is unlimited because you just add more servers and that's it. So this was the tricky part. Uh, the tricky part was we needed to decide how we would do, for, do this for MariaDB, uh, RabbitMQ, Couchbase. So these are persistent. So we cannot just reschedule a container because we want. We still have all the data that that container generated. Uh, right now we're exposing the, the volumes uh, in the hosts. 
uh, to run uh, the databases and uh, Couchbase also. Um, <clears throat> the way, uh, so these containers themselves, they're in containers just for the fact that we can get like the configuration management done for free. First, the second part is uh, we can restart the container if get, in case we have any problems and we eliminate all the issues that we might have due to memory leaks and so on. Uh, and then we uh, are just using for now systemd to start and stop, stop the containers. We have, don't have an orchestration on top of this just because of uh, the persistent storage issue. We are at this moment implementing uh, an orchestration, um, sorry, an orchestration to uh, allow for the MariaDB uh, topology to be managed dynamically. In that way, we can either remove containers or either remove servers at any point in time, uh, and it will restart replication automatically. And hopefully, when we do that, we can do uh, uh, something better with what we have at the moment. So in this case, the issues that we had were the data volumes and the performance for the precision, uh, the network issues, uh, the network problems that we might have. So we use NetHost. And then in terms of uh, to guarantee CPU performance, we went to, with the Numa node. So for those who don't know what a Numa node is or how you can use it, we basically tell the container that's going to use a specific Numa node. A Numa node is a, basically a CPU. So if you have a machine with uh, 40 physical CPUs, we're telling him you can use these CPUs. Okay, And then that way the machine is bound to do CPUs and it can use them freely and exclusively. Okay? So that way we guarantee the CPU performance, we avoid noisy neighbors like we say here, we avoid having other processes in the machines causing issues to your databases. Uh, so here uh, we're still not taking full advantage of the containers, we already have some of that like I told you but not fully adv full advantages. Next we had uh, the continuous integration we already had automatic builds, we, we had Jenkins, we, we built upon it by putting Jenkins on top of our containers and Jenkins now launches his own slaves, does the, does the build, destroys the slave and, and that in, improves the process somewhat. Uh, also we now do automatic kills from, bit, uh, from Git, we run our code coverage, code smells and uh, we check for bugs and vulnerabilities, by that we use uh, Bamboo, Sunner Cube and um, I think those are the two tools that we use. So yeah, Bamboo and Sunner Cube. Bamboo, um, we introduced Sunner Cube after we had the Jenkins running the automatic builds on top of Docker. So that was a, an advantage of already having Docker there. For service discovery, uh, an issue with running a, a distributed infrastructure and the issue that we had in which we had to hard code the values was when we changed something. So for service discovery, we introduced two, something, two things. One were the internal DNS. We already had it at the time, but the question is someone has to update that internal DNS. Either you do it as a system administrator or you have something to do it for you. So the orchestrator that we chose, Rancher, has the capability of running some subzone of the DNS. So we implemented a high level internal DNS that we manage. And then Rancher has a subzone that we delegate on our high level inter DNS. So Rancher, as soon as it launches a container or a stack, you will create a uh, DNS entry for that container and you can automatically reach it by just pulling the DNS uh, record. Console, which is another part of our infrastructure where we uh, basically publicize our uh, persistent uh, storage, RabbitMQ, uh, MySQL, and Couchbase. So when a container from RabbitMQ, MySQL, and Couchbase starts, it registers itself for console and console generates an internal DNS record for it. So these will serve first for the application to be able to reach these services and then for what we see here, centralization of the metrics. So for the metrics, we use Telegraph on each host. Each physical machine or virtual machine has a Telegraph ser service running. That Telegraph service is running and it's querying console to know which services are running in this, this specific machine. And when something changes on that machine, Telegraph knows, restarts, and starts listening to those servers and scraping the metrics. So we no longer have to concern ourselves which metrics to listen in each server. Then uh, Prometheus, <coughs> we run Prometheus exporter inside our container and that on our application of the container. The application is, has a Prometheus endpoint which is exporting metrics from the actions that it do. The front end exports metrics for what it does, the back end, so on. So our application is now uh, sending metrics automatically just by running 
we don't have to do anything about it. So the server is scraping those metrics automatically. So Prometheus server uh, is querying basically the DNS and the console server. And as soon as the service is starting to run and it's automatically balanced, uh, the Prometheus server knows about it and starts pulling the metrics from the server. So we don't have to do anything. If the server disappears, you don't have to do anything because the DNS record will disappear or the record will disappear from console and Prometheus stops scraping those metrics and no longer have any concerns about those. Alert manage is a way that we raise alarm. So in alert manage, we define policies for alerting. And when, for example, CPU on one of our hosts or the number of writes of our, one of our application drops, for example, we can have an alert notifying the development team saying, OK, this node or this application doesn't have any sessions for the last five hours, which is weird. So we can have alerts from that. So alert manager normally uh, sends alerts to OpGenie, which is our centralized uh, applic the, the application that we use externally to, to notify the SLE teams or to Slack. So how do we know that we need to rescale a container, uh, reschedule a container from our applications? Uh, we don't, and we don't need to know. So the way we did that we did it and our, our developers did it was we create a slash health at HTTP endpoint. So the application reports their health. So the application says, I'm healthy because I can communicate with everyone or I'm kind of healthy, but don't reschedule me. I cannot communicate with my MySQL, but it's still within the my time limit. So let's wait a bit. Or the application can say, I'm completely unhealthy. Please reschedule me uh, at will. And the, the orchestrator will kill the application and send it to another server and so on. So that for us was also important because that way the ops team doesn't have to understand the specifics of each application. The application reports those. And so it's something that for the devs it's also important because that way they can control the way that application will be scheduled in the infrastructure. So it was a win-win for both sides. So here is our current setup. We're still not finished with this migration, not 100%. We have everything in place that we need. It's just a question of us moving past some events that we're going to have in our uh, roadmap so we can kill the rest of our physical dedicated hosts and move on to a full container infrastructure. So, but most of our front ends already only does one thing. Uh, we already have a backend API container. We still have some stuff running here, mostly due to cron jobs and producers, consumers. These are, are, we're finishing this. But from what you can see here right now, we have full, well, we have containers almost on everything. We're just finishing up these two small pieces here. And as soon as we did it, we'll, we'll be happier, at least I will. So the main advantage of this is we can write our infrastructure as a code because everything will be in our registry and in our Docker files. Uh, rollbacks are much faster. So if we need to roll back here, we roll it back. We just say, okay, roll back my image to the latest for the previous version and you're done. You don't need to do anything, you can go home. So what did we gain from all of this work? Uh, first, we gain a lot of headaches because you're gonna break a lot of stuff. I didn't write that down there, but it's true. So we have faster deployments now. We can uh, move to a new version of our application much faster. Uh, we, as soon as the build is done, you can do the migration uh, in less than five minutes across our whole infrastructure. But you can start doing the migration and forget about it because the orchestration will take care of that for you. you. Just say, okay, upgrade to my latest version and you can make sure you can go home because you know the orchestration will take care of it. If and if it can't, it will leave the old version working. So you don't lose anything. If you lose connectivity, your orchestration will take care of it for you. Blue and green deployments. Uh, so for those who don't know or know, uh, the blue normally have either the blue or the green stack running. And when you want to switch or upgrade to deploy your application, you deploy to the applications to the stack which is not running. And then you switch it as soon as the new stack is ready. We can do kind of release. Uh, we don't know it on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's the possibility is there. We sometimes do it when we need to. Uh, it's not yet as common as we might become in the future, we hope. Like I said previously, faster infrastructure as code, faster upgrade, we have infrastructure as code. Fast rollbacks, why do we have three asterisks there? So the rollbacks still depend on the database. So when you have a database in your application, is doing applic uh, you're doing something, uh, database migrations, you cannot roll back <laughs> just because <laughs> you have to think about the database. But yeah, you can do rollbacks. In case you don't have any, any, any application on the database migration, you can roll back as simply as flipping a switch. Uh, which is most of the deployments that we have. We don't have migrations on the database on the day-to-day -day basis. That would be kind of stupid. 
uh, and then fast switching. Uh, so we can switch uh, for, for new versions, like I said, we can switch containers, we can switch application stacks and so on. So pitfalls, the issues that we encountered during this one year and a half was this error here that uh, when you have that, the, the, you can check out this GitHub. But basically when you have, uh, when you're launching containers very frequently, you'll encounter something which is concurrency and that concurrency will generate a kernel lock which will lock out your machine and will first restart your machine. And we encountered this. Uh, this is not as common now with the new kernel versions, but uh, one year and a half ago, we were using Dev and Wheezy with kernel 3.6, I think, and uh, we had to restart almost all our infrastructure on a day to day basis, which sucks. <laughs> uh, and then the orchestrator that we chose, Rancher in the early days. Uh, Rancher is awesome, and now it's much better uh, for a small deployment uh, and small, I say, up to 50 machines. Uh, it works very well. Uh, the issue that Rancher has, and it still has it, is that they use a transactional database on the background. That means that every action is recorded on a transactional database. So if you upgrade or reschedule or whatever you do on Rancher, it's going to record on a transactional database. And that's your bottleneck. And it's a bigger bottleneck. Looking back, I would not use Rancher. Uh, I would probably invest more on Kubernetes or Mesos. Uh, we did look at Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker Swarm, and so on before we started doing the, the migration. Swarm was not simply not ready. Kubernetes, we also had several issues deploying stuff. Uh, Mesos was way complicated in terms of networking layer. And Rancher did all, almost all of that for free, but then we had all those issues. So I would definitely invest more on these first. And now I would do Kubernetes, basically, if I had to start now. Forward, we want to do continuous deployment with functional testing. It's something that the team, the DevOps team is working on and wants to get out of the way. Uh, MariaDB replication topology. So like I said, our DBA is working uh, on uh, Ghost, which is something from, um, no, not Ghost, sorry. The orchestrator from GitHub, which allow us to do this. So get the containers and an orchestrator. So, this depends a little bit on this, so uh, it's still something that we need to, to get out of the way. Uh, we are looking into Nomad maybe before uh, we go with Kubernetes, for example, because Nomad from Ashicorp uh, allows you to do some orchestration, but uh, when you say, okay, I want to run my MySQL containers in these machines, and it does it. Um, it's basically a simple, a number version of the Kubernetes. And don't quote you on that because it's not actually a number, it's just different, okay. The cross -satter that the cross data center queuing system, right now our RabbitMQ, which is our main queuing system, which we depend on, is just living on the physical data center. Uh, we will need to break that out before we're fully multi-DC aware. Uh, JMeter testing, so we do JMeter, we use JMeter for doing load testing, we want to add those to the Jenkins pipelines, that way we have always have a baseline whenever we do a build, in the end we have a baseline of our performance of that container. And then we want to make the container, <coughs> the continuous integration depend on unit integration tests. What does that mean? We already do the unit integration tests, but the build can be successful even if, if the bamboo test fail. Not that the bamboo, but um, the turner cube test. Sorry. For now, it's not a, f a, a requirement for them to finish. So I already exceeded my time. So thank you. And um, any questions? Any questions, anyone? Hi. Uh, so you started by saying that you departed to containerizing things because configuration management was not good for your use case. Can you explain? Like, explain yeah, that so, a little bit better. Um, like I told you, we started with Puppet um, for about three years or four years ago. We, uh, from the beginning, we had Puppet. Then came the time we wanted to upgrade to the new version of Puppet from 2 to 4, and we decided, okay, we suck at Puppet, so let's try something new. Hey, we like Python, let's try SaltStack. So we tried SaltStack. Um, we suck at SaltStack, apparently, also. Yeah. No, the question is, we have... Um, 
the way that we work because we have something called a venture awareness, a country awareness. So that means that we have a lot of configurations that depend on a specific country and that variate across the, the countries. So the dependency on the configuration, the, the configuration management become way too complicated because then you have countries connected to servers, connected to applications, and then when you want to change something, it becomes a snowball, and you have to change everything across multiple configuration management files. And then when you run the configuration management tool, and it happened in both systems, Puppet and SaltStack, we were at one point running the tool five, six times before we were in the end product that we wanted, the fully tricked out server ready to go. And then had, that had an issue is, hey, now we don't need a server to run this specific operation. I want to run this. Now I need to redo everything or reinstall my server, open a ticket at the center, send it to reinstall, and now I want to run my configuration management again. And then we multiply this by 100 machines. And the time that it takes to do this, uh, I can give you an example. On Black Friday 2015, we added 30 new servers, and it took us three full days of two system administrators working to get the servers run, just running, We're ready to have the application being deployed. And it's not doable, not in the way that we want. Um, and we still want to maintain a physical data center for several reasons. Uh, so we don't want, if we want with AWS, for example, we have the name already and yeah, it's simpler. But then if we want to move to uh, physical data center, how do you do AMIs? You can do stuff like uh, use uh, virtual machines and so on, but not something, then you're basically doing uh, Amazon for yourself and we didn't want that. Uh, and so the configuration management for us was just another bonus of going with the container. But yes, that was the issue for us is the way that our configuration management works due to the dependency of the country <laughs> uh, made it uh, way more complicated than uh, if I wanted to run one application, global application we've had, only one Jumia site, it was easy. I had one configuration management, it was easier. Now I have 15 Jumia sites that I need to run in conjunction <laughs> at the same uh, time. I'm curious, where does the configuration live now? So we have a console is storing all the configuration variables and the orchestrator also has some environment variables that it passes onto the containers. So we still use SaltStack. We're phasing out SaltStack, but the idea is to have Terraform. Uh, Terraform will provision uh, uh, basically our console and insert the variables that we need there. And we use then uh, ConfD or uh, something else to read the variables from console into the containers and application knows that the, conf the, the variables that it needs, it reads them from console and it's up and running. We use vault on top of console to have our secrets. Obviously, we don't want passwords to be stored on console, but um, so that's basically the, our plan for, for the future. It's still not finished, like I told you, but it's, it's there already. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, with Kubernetes, you have ETCD, which is something that we're still not implementing Kubernetes fully because of that small, small, which is not that small. But yeah, we want to continue to use console because we think it's a good tool. It fits our needs. Okay. More questions? Oh, everyone wants to go home. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Me too. More questions? No. I think we can call it today then. Thank you for coming, guys. Thanks a lot.